Hello and welcome to another episode of the Spiritual Sexual Shamanic Podcast. I am Simon Marvell and I'm here today with Amanda Argo. Now, Amanda is a psychedelic wellness advocate, integration educator and facilitator who speaks about the intersection of culture, consciousness and ecology. Founder of Integra, she architects transformative integration programs for people to reconnect to themselves, to others and the world around them. She bridges neuroscience of altered states with traditional wisdom, blending contemporary practices, nature connectedness, uh, philosophy, and creative tools that inspire people to live more authentic and purposeful lives. Amanda? Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Such a pleasure. Yes. We're in Lisbon, Portugal today, and we live just around the corner from one another. So we're able to be here in person. If, yeah. you lis if you're just listening to the audio online, um, you can also head over to the, to the YouTube channel and, and get a sense of like the room and us, us talking here. Um, I was, I'm so, I'm so glad to have you here. Um, because I think that in, in the zeitgeist that, um, that ISTA is part of at the moment, um, as well as other organizations and practitioners, um, doing similar work to ISTA, um, the conversation has really like, um, in a super focused and attentive way turned towards things like preparation and for an integration of ritual experiences, experiences of altered states of consciousness as those experiences become more possible in the world. Um, and, and you've really dedicated like the last more than 10 years of your life to exactly those questions. Mm -hmm. Is it, so would you be able to give us a sense of um, what you do and 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 how you came to do that yes of course <laughs> um i would say you know i i have been involved in this space in the last 10 years although really stemming from a more personal journey and only in the last several years have i really now taken this um to the next level to actually be here to support people in integrating their altered states but yeah it does go back uh, almost 10 years I myself was struggling from mental health issues and I was taking all kinds of pharmaceutical drugs, it was a product of that American pharma system. Uh, I didn't know what else to do at the time. Mm. And so, yeah, that, that was the way I, I could heal myself is by basically numbing my, my suffering and not really looking at really what was the root cause of why I was feeling the way I was. And I met a community of people that were doing things a bit differently. They were, yeah, very much a community um, doing different types of ecstatic trance, dance, and meditations, and yoga. And, and they also were working with plant medicine. And it was there that I did plant medicine, psychedelics for the first time. And that really opened the door for me. Uh, that changed a lot because it showed me that I could actually heal myself I could actually take this power back to my own hands and and look at what was what was really happening to me instead of just numbing myself with medications and so that was the start of this very long life integration as I like to call it of that experience and slowly starting to incorporate that more as as part of my dharma as part of my purpose uh, several several years after working in the tech space I I went back to university because I was actually really interested in the science of these altered states and why I was feeling the way I was and why I was getting well in that sense. Of course, um, it wasn't about the substance. It was about what I was doing after, but I, I was really curious. And so I got my master's degree in neuroscience and I was really interested in how we can leave the effects of plant-based medicines, fungi like psilocybin, psychedelic magic mushrooms, together with psychotherapy. 
And it was around that time that I that I joined, when I finished my degree, I joined a company that was making investments into the psychedelic space. So I had this really big bird's eye view of where this whole psychedelic renaissance was going, all the infrastructure that was being built to support safe and accessible legal psychedelic care. Uh, this, you know, in the United States in particular, there's quite a lot of advancements in this. And when I was working with this company, I saw so many people talking about, you know, doing the psychedelics, the delivery of the drugs, but no one was really concerned about what happens after, which for me is the most important part. It's why I was getting well, because I was taking the steps to integrate that incredible plant medicine journey in my life. Mm. And so I realized, okay, well, people are just reaching these peak states, these mountaintops, and they're not integrating. And that's where I chose to really create these systems um, to support integration for people, for facilitators, for retreat centers that are hosting these experiences, for organizations that want to understand a lot of what I do is education and training and harm reduction and really helping people to see what the potential of these psychedelic states are, but also how we can make meaning from them in a really grounded and, and sustainable way and not in a way that just dissipates over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. Um, so there's lots in there to unpack, but um, I want to bring in one element that we touched on briefly before we started recording, which is this idea of what an altered state of consciousness is and how it relates, but also is like, um, has potential to be different to, um, an experience on plant medicine. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's this notion. I, especially with the, the psychedelic integration teaching that I do that psychedelic is just about the substance, but actually, I consider psychedelic to be anything that induces an altered state of consciousness, which is, you know, this, this heightened response to external stimuli, this sense of boundlessness, even in unity with the universe, you can reach these very peak states of being that are not induced by substance. Mm. Uh, there are different kinds of altered states. There's the pharmacological altered state, which is psychedelic substance induced. But you have other types like uh, induced through breath work, through meditative practices. Uh, trauma can be considered an altered state. Mm -hmm. uh, the pathological altered state of having a seizure, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, there's uh, hypnosis is an altered state. Dreaming is you're in, you're in a different state of consciousness at that stage. And so what I'm really fascinated by is that we are moving towards seeking altered states, but they're not just psychedelic mm. substances, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, these altered states are being shown to, um, you know, psychedelic substance induced are more directly um, changing brain chemistry. But from a qualitative subjective perspective, we're still finding tremendous amounts of healing they can also create a lot of somatic, uh, it's very much a somatic experience as well. Right? Mm. These altered states are, are, are being felt physically in the body. Yeah. Um, regardless. Yeah. So something we say a lot in, in ISTA is, is that what we're using is breath, sound and movement. Mm. And this is it. Like we, we, we don't, we don't use plant medicines, right. um, <clears throat> but we do really work with breath, sound, and movement. It's precisely embodied, like the, the shamanic tools that we're using are, are those, and, and they're produced by the body, they're experienced by the body, and there's no question that they, they can take you into an altered state. Why would we want to go into an altered state? Why would we choose that? What are the benefits? <laughs> yeah, well, there's many reasons why. Some are very curious and want to jump on the the, the bandwagon of seeing everyone else do these crazy things. But in all seriousness, I feel that we are increasingly more disconnected as a, as a society from ourselves, from others, from the world we live in, from the natural world we're part of. And so we're seeking, we're finding that these altered states are, are kind of 
helping us to see that we have this greater connection from a more transpersonal perspective is what I'm starting with here. And mm -hmm. um, it can be highly uh, healing for people to reach a state so that they can actually feel in their bodies that they and, and, and actually observe that they are a part of something bigger. And that can be a very healing um, um, experience mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. um, I like to say that altered states, when they're done intentionally, can really lead us to this feeling of transcendence, um, transformation, and a movement towards wholeness. So wholeness is really about how we are whole within ourselves, but whole within this like greater system, interconnected system between our relationships and wholeness with us and, and nature. Um, this, this understanding that we are also nature, nature is us. So, we're, we're looking to feel that when we're in an altered state mm -hmm. um, from a neuroscientific perspective, uh, there's studies that are now being done to help um, people understand or for us to really understand what is actually happening when we're reaching an altered state. So mm -hmm. with the psychedelic substance induced, um, for example, LSD or DMT, psilocybin, there are studies that are showing that they can modulate activity in a region of the brain called the default mode network or the DMN, which is considered the seat of the ego. It's the site of introspection and self-referential thought. And it's an area that's considered more rigid in people who have uh, mental health issues like depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. They're really characterized by this ruminative behavior, this, these thought patterns that keep repeating themselves, this rigidity. And when psychedelics are, are being taken, psychedelic substances, it's letting the brain be more flexible and adaptable to changes. So we're looking at our thoughts more from a detached perspective. We're seeing that we can change these thought patterns and behaviors. And so this activity is really interesting, um, especially for the medical community who wants to kind of find a, a medicalized view on why these psychedelics are actually helpful for us. They're also known to induce neuroplasticity and the formation and connections of neurons mm. in the brain. Um, it reduces activity in the amygdala, which is this reptilian fight or flight response. So we're feeling less activated. Um, unless, of course, we're actually reaching a life-threatening situation. Mm. It's very healthy for us to have a, a very strong fight or flight when we're actually in danger, mm. the lion in front of us, right? Mm. But for people who are in heightened states of anxiety and they're being, um, yeah, they're being stimulated by sense, external stimuli that's, that's not actually supposed to activate them in that way, these psychedelics help reduce that activity so mm. it regulates our nervous system in that way mm. Mm. so that could be a reason for people right <laughs> there's a few reasons in there yeah. um and and to get, say again um when you say this is just to repeat when you say psychedelic substance you are not just meaning plant medicine or some of these ones that we might think of <clears throat> you also mean things like breath sound and movement yes yeah, so ecstatic dance, for example, is one that's really popular now, especially in Portugal um, and in other places of the world. That might be a substance that we take, in a sense. Yeah. Dance. Yeah, right? dance is a, su it's a <coughs> substance that we choose. Yeah. You know, people in shamanic cultures and in ancient cultures have been working in these ecstatic ecstasis for millennia, mm -hmm. the trance movement, the African drumming, the Sufi dervish, the whirling, the Sufi whirling dance. Like these are all things that have been done by traditions for a long time to induce an ecstatic state. Mm. And yes, it's to have some of them are doing so for a greater connection with the divine or spirit because they consider their bodies as a vessel or a channel for connecting to the spirit. But it's also a way for us to tap into ourselves and, and also another reason why people do these psychedelic states is to have a greater capacity for the language of their emotional body. So we can start mm. to feel again. Mm. People who are not feeling work with these transformational states like sound, movement, breath, 
to be able to identify and tap into the emotions that live in the body mm. and to say, okay, I'm feeling sad right now. What does that actually feel like? Where is that in my body? Huh. Where is anger in my body? Huh. Where is joy? Uh -huh. These psychedelic states help us have a greater capacity for having that conversation with ourselves, ultimately. Mm. 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 Wow, yeah. So would you say that those emotional responses to what's happening in our lives um, or maybe what has happened in our lives, they're always happening, whether we're kind of, those emotional states are always being produced, whether we're conscious of them or not, or whether we're aware of them happening or not, and that there's benefit in us being able to feel them more fully or be more aware of them. And, and that it should be an embodied awareness? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, many <clears> of us are living our day to day and we, we probably have stored some emotions that are, that are living in the body that haven't been allowed to express itself. And then it creates, obviously, it can create physical disease um, but, uh, or tensions in the body. And so these psychedelic states are a way of releasing that in order to express and then we can express ourselves more wholly mm. so it's really this uh, part of the, the emotional state the physical the spiritual and the cognitive all together is really creating this movement towards this whole being that we are mm. Mm. yeah amazing one of the reasons i was really interested in talking to you was um was in relation to a question that i've had for quite a long time around um because well i think there's a lot out there about the benefit about what we've been talking about up and up until this point the, the benefits um but also the edginess of yeah. you know experiences of altered states that edginess is part of the reason that people are so fascinated by it like um it's borderline legal, illegal, depending on where you are and, and what the exact circumstances um, of the experience are. Um, and so, so there's, a, there's a bit of conversation around this already. Um, so my interest has turned um, towards the facilitation of those experiences for people. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people are also getting interested in that. They're, in, they're becoming psychedelic therapists. Um, trip sitting at festivals is becoming um, a more common, uh, well, festivals are getting more interested from what I can sense in providing safe spaces for people to trip, basically, take um, substances like this. So you have tents, you have trip sitters, you have like sort of, um, emergency medical services available. Um, so maybe my question is, could you tell us a little bit about what a trip sitter is, what they do, and um, and what are some sort of best practices for for trip sitting? Yeah, so in, I'm, I'm very pleased that more festivals and more places where there are altered states experiences happening of all kinds, so substance induced or not, are having more um, awareness around the importance of having these centers where people can feel safe and supported. Uh, harm reduction is a really important part of someone's experience and it also determines the quality of their integration. So we can talk about that later. Um, but trip sitting really is, it is in most cases a peer support. I mean, this is different from actual space holder facilitator, but the trip sitting aspect mm. is mm. peer to peer in mm. many cases, especially in more recreational contexts, mm -hmm. like, um, at a festival, for example. And it is really about providing that space for people to navigate a challenging experience. Most of the time people are, are seeking support when they're having a, a difficult time and you know bad trips people talk about bad trips i like to call them challenging experiences rather than bad because bad implies that something you're doing it might be wrong or what is happening to you is inherently wrong or that there's some kind of shame around what that experience could actually be for you and so i i often like to reframe it more as having a challenging experience mm -hmm. 
And uh, for example, there, there are some really, um, to, to speak from my experience working with Zendo Project, which is a, a psychedelic peer support trip sitting uh, platform that works at Burning Man, for example, among other places. It's um, some of their principles that I learned. One of them is a creating that safe space, that safe container, and that can look different for different people. Um, in the realm where I work personally and how I help integrate people, it's really for facilitated, intentional psychedelic journeys. Mm -hmm. And that is also very important to have a space that is really um, in full service of whatever is about to happen, that transformation that's about to occur, whether it be a place that you know, is, is more embedded in uh, where it's quiet, where it's a comfortable temperature, these kind of things. It's important to have that space, especially if someone has been out and about navigating and they can return to themselves. Uh, another aspect of sitting, trip sitting, rather than facilitation, mm -hmm. is um, really sitting and not guiding, mm -hmm. having a non-directive approach, not trying to help them process or make sense of what's happening to really be there and like, you know, okay, what's happening now? Let's reflect on that. You're not their therapist. Mm -hmm. You're just there for them. Mm -hmm. You're holding space for them. And for some people, it might mean just sitting with them and saying nothing, just sitting next to them. For others, it might mean touching their, holding their hand. If you give, if they give you consent to do so, of course, to really just have a presence with them. And for other people, it might be having a conversation, helping them just navigate what they're what they're experiencing, but just to help kind of normalize a little bit their experience, um, not trying to guide them in a particular way. Mm -hmm. Another aspect is uh, really about um, there's another element with Sendo that that comes up. Um, yeah, this, this notion of difficult not being, you know, challenging, not necessarily being bad, not trying to to help them come out of whatever challenge they're having, mm -hmm. but just letting them experience it mm -hmm. and, and letting them know that they're okay, but they can experience what they're experiencing without judgment. Right. It's really important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, not trying to diminish what they're, what they're feeling or to mm. bring them back to the reality and say, Oh, this isn't, this isn't real. Or you're, you know, you're not, everything will be fine. You know, all these kind of ways that we might think we're trying to support. Um, it might actually be more traumatic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 This idea of the only way out is through. Yeah, exactly. Um, we kind of, if we're trip sitting, maybe we need to just know that that's the case and help them through exactly. rather than try and like intervene and drag them out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and with facilitation, there is a very fine line with this whole directive approach versus non directive. Mm -hmm. Do you, mm -hmm. when you see someone having a challenging experience mm -hmm. or you see them crying very, audibly very very intensely and mm -hmm. you can see that they're going through something for example when do you go and what do you do mm -hmm. and how do you know that what you're doing is not feeding into something or it, or it's actually just being a sense of support mm -hmm. there is often um i see this a lot in I've, I'm, I'm part of a lot of um more shamanic indigenous um contexts of which people are doing plant medicine, for example. And I also see how it can be translated to more of the Western based, you know, psilocybin retreats in the Netherlands, for example. So mm -hmm. there's different ways of people doing these altered states mm -hmm. and what approach isn't right or wrong, but it comes from a different cultural background mm -hmm. um, from a more indigenous origin. It's really like, let them be, mm -hmm. let them take care of whatever they're doing because mm -hmm. that's part of the healing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're crying because they need to learn to be there for themselves, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And not be saved by anyone else. Mm. Or you can also go there and support and offer a gentle consensual touch or just talk with them or just be there. Um, not to try and save anyone or try and make that go away, but really to be just a, a loving support that they maybe never had mm. when they were 
younger and that's perhaps maybe what's coming up for them. We don't know. Right? Yeah. But there's just different ways of approaching mm. this. And, and, and you would say that um, one approach is not necessarily better or worse than the other. Yeah. Um, it, that's correct? Yeah, yeah. There, it's, there are different schools of thought, yeah. different ways of approaching it. Mm. What is important, though, regardless mm. of how you're sitting for someone, is that they have that you've been given permission to sit with them, and to be with them. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, this is their journey, and they need to be able to express that they, they want support. Uh, they need to be able to express, you know, obviously, ideally a contract is kind of set before with people, but, you know, what their boundaries and their limitations are to make sure that they are not being violated in any way, mm -hmm. emotionally, physically, um, if they want to be touched a certain way. Always they have this uh, to retain sort of the autonomy in their own decisions on how they want to be treated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that should be remained first and foremost a priority. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so you, you made quite clear the distinction between trip sitting and facilitation um, of these spaces. Could you go a little bit further into the facilitation um, aspect of things? Yeah, so trip sitting is generally um, very much peer to peer. It's you're there to support. You're you're really there to ensure that they're safe, that they're getting their water, that they're that they're feeling comfortable. Uh, you might be a trip sitter and assistant to the facilitator, for example. But the facilitation is really someone who is there to hold the space and, in many ways, has the responsibility for you and for whoever else might be there. Um, and that responsibility takes on a different dimension, right? They're there to facilitate your journey. They may not be with you one-on-one, -on -one, but they are holding that container with whatever altered state experience it might be, whether it be substance or not. They are guiding you. They're setting the stage uh, for that experience to happen and see it to its finish. Mm -hmm. So they are sort of the space the knee space holder. Mm -hmm. Um, and every facilitator is obviously very different and for sure it de depends also very much in culture mm -hmm. in, with substance induced altered states these these more traditional aspects of facilitation take on a very different dimension you mentioned shamanism which is not just psychedelic substance right shamanism is takes on many different forms mm -hmm. um a shaman, for example, might hold space as a facilitator very differently from a psychotherapist. Mm -hmm. They have a different training. They have mm -hmm. a different understanding of what it means to support. Mm -hmm. uh, they have different liabilities. They have um, a, a different set of ethical principles. And all of these need to be taken into consideration, especially if somebody is entering that space for the first time, to be aware of these differences so that they can feel the most prepared. Mm. for what might happen. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Um, so interesting. Um, so, okay, if, if, someone's having, if someone's having a really difficult time, like they're, they're starting to spin out, is there some kind of like go-to emergency response? Mm. Um, and, and here I ask this question, um, the, like the next thing that comes to me is like every, every each experience is so individual and so contextual yeah. and it's going to depend on so many other factors. Um, but are there any kind of guidelines that you could offer in addition to what you've been talking about that like if, some, if something goes really, starts to get really hairy, mm. you know? Yeah, so it's a great question because it comes up a lot in my work when I, when I teach integration, I also hmm. bring up this aspect of how we can understand uh, a, a challenging experience that borders into perhaps what we would define as perhaps a psychotic break or when somebody's really in a, in a very hairy state hmm. um, that we, we see something might be happening, but we, we don't really know how to navigate it, especially when we're talking about substance-induced. There, this is where the question of, who is holding that space and through what lens and through what worldviews are we actually experiencing this? So somebody who is a shaman, an indigenous spiritual leader who is holding that space might see this very hairy situation as very much 
safe in the context of that container that he or she has built um, because of the energy around it. It can become, it's kind of a spiritual awakening emergency. It's a, it's a, it's, there's a, there's something happening that needs to happen um, based on sort of the energy that's been created in that space. Now, we may not see that as a safe thing or a correct thing to do because we're saying, okay, wow, they are borderline psychotic right now. In any other context, we would say maybe they need to go to the hospital to seek immediate attention. So uh, there's this man, Stan, Stanislav Grof, who is the founder of Holotropic Breathwork. He has spoken a lot about the spiritual emergence, the spiritual crisis. And um, this is something that he's trying to attempt to reconcile his psychology, medical, clinical training with that of a more spiritual realm. Um, how do we support people who are having these experiences where they may actually be hairy in the moment, but they might be extraordinarily healing for somebody at the end of the day, and they might return to normalcy. It's not like a, a permanent state, although it can be scary if it lasts for days, weeks. Um, how do we navigate that through our cultural framework? Or how do I perhaps, or you, you know, I have a background in neuroscience, but I also have this experience with spiritual indigenous traditions. How do I balance both of those and look at the individual with, um, you know, really looking at it from an individual from for their specific case. It's challenging because one person might approach it and say, okay, they need drugs right now to calm them down. But another will say, no, they're, they're, something is happening. Let it happen. So, yeah, it doesn't answer a question directly. And I am not also, I'm not a clinician. I'm not a clinical psychologist. So I'm giving you my perspective as a non-clinician without the liabilities of a clinician. That's mm -hmm. another thing. Mm -hmm. So if a facilitator is a clinical psychologist or a psychiatrist, they have different responsibilities and liability. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they are bound in some cases when they see that their life is at, at their, their, their at risk of harming themselves or mm -hmm. others, or they're in a state of maybe psychos psychosis, they are liable and therefore they must report those people and send those people to a clinical mm -hmm. uh, to a hospital, for example, mm -hmm. to be treated. Mm -hmm. Whereas other facilitators who are more uh, working in the transpersonal dimensions or they're more shamanic trained, they don't have that liability, mm -hmm. so they can allow that unfolding to happen mm -hmm. naturally. Mm -hmm. So it really depends also the container, the setting that we're in. Mm -hmm. If, for example, if there's a hairy state where when I was trip sitting at Burning Man, we have a medical um, sort of like this, we have a medical triage and we're right next to the medical tent. So if something gets to be a little too much, there is somebody who's trained to be able to kind of say, okay, they need to now go into that realm. Mm. But we would prefer not. We mm. would actually let them, let them in, as long as they are visibly okay, that they let whatever is unfolding to unfold and giving them the safe place to do that. So it's really a balance. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. mm. Fascinating. So <laughs> fascinating. So fascinating. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a couple of directions we could go, but um, yeah, in, in, in your answer there, I'm hearing like the, import, the importance of concerted uh, integration, um, like a, a planned for integration process. Um, and, the, and by integration, I mean the period after the peak mm -hmm. of the altered state. Um, where you're kind of coming back down into a quote-unquote normalized um, state of consciousness. You're coming back into your regular life, whatever that looks like. Um, having in full knowledge that you've had this altered state experience and going, okay, how can I allow those two worlds, the altered state world and my regular world, to come together in some way? Yeah. Um, so this is kind of what we mean by integration. Integration. Um, so in what you're saying there, it sounds like that integration process can 
and our approach to it can look radically different mm -hmm. depending on yeah cultural background the specific nature of an individual's altered state experience um yeah yeah and you have if i understand correctly you've developed a kind of like uh, a, a method or, or like a like a particular approach um, for structuring an altered state of consciousness that maybe has um, approaches that integration phase in a specific way. Could you tell us a little bit about that sort of overall method um, that you've developed? Sure. So I've I've created together with my my business partner and amazing woman Sasha Green. We've created. Um, a reciprocal, it's called the reciprocal method of integration. And it's specifically, uh, it came from the fact that we are both, in, we both integrate people from altered state experiences in very unique ways. I myself um, come from a, 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 you know, a different kind of background. I'm not a licensed clinician, but I, I do coaching. I do space holding in, in a sort of a different kind of more transpersonal, spiritual based way. Sasha is a clinical psychologist and a body psychotherapist, and we both realize that we need to create a structure, a plan for people who are also facilitating experiences. So not only integrating them themselves, but who are holding space, whether they be breath workers or dance, uh, ecstatic dance instructors or Reiki healers or coaches or psychedelic guides, whatever, wh however they're holding space, it's to create this process so that they can navigate that for themselves and for for their clients for their journeyers so this this program this sort of protocol again it's not meant to be like a this is how you integrate and these are this is the only way it's going to be effective mm -hmm. it's more of really expanding our understanding of what it means to actually integrate and how to do so given the tools that we have and to find tools that can work for us based on our unique characteristics, mm -hmm. based on how we would make sense of the world, based on our values and our worldviews. Mm. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, we also say, and there's sort of an approach that really starts with preparation. Uh, integration, it does begin with preparation and how we approach the, the actual altered state experience itself and the, the, the intentions that we set in that preparation. So the quality of, your, quality of our intention and preparation determines the quality of our integration. Mm -hmm. It's directly proportional mm -hmm. because if we are not coming into a space, having had the right set of tools to self-regulate, to understand how to manage our, our, our whole being, we're not going to be able to, to do so after. It doesn't just magically grant us those tools. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes people want to jump into a psychedelic experience and they are seeing all the people that have these, these peak moments and they want to have it as well, but they have no practice uh, that helps them manage their emotional state or even have an understanding of what it means to let go of control. Mm -hmm. Do they know what that even feels like in a non-altered state? Mm -hmm. Do they have the ability to... Mm -hmm navigate what that could be like so that when that happens they're prepared and they're not potentially re-traumatized during an experience mm. so that's just one example uh, do you have the tools that you can use later do you even know you know what it could be like to to, to have a, a meditation practice five minutes a day mm. to be able to use that later to come back to as an anchor point so integration as a framework is really starting with preparation navigating that, the harm reduction aspect of the actual experience to make sure that the integration is safe and supported. Mm. And then there's a process of integration and that can be, that can be as long as it needs to be. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an emphasis on allowing that unfolding without it being, you know, that balance between it being a directive integration versus a sort of an organic one. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a couple of different sort of tips that I like to offer for people. One of them is maybe quite obvious or not actually is one of the most challenging things to do to integrate. And that is to rest, to mm -hmm. do nothing. Mm -hmm. So that's a big one. Yeah. <laughs> Very hard to do. 
But I want to do it actively. I want to force that integration. I want to force that experience. I want to harvest all the information that it's given me. Yeah. I want to do all this stuff. Exactly. And like, you're telling me I just need to like not do anything. For the immediate aftermath, you're talking about like what could happen right after. You know, so many of us want to just start immediately making those Act changes. Act on all the realizations, exactly. change everything about our lives. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Doing nothing is actually allowing the body to rest mm. because whatever substance, and that substance can be a psychedelic substance, it could be a breath state, it could be a trance, it could be a music, sensory deprivation, mm. whatever it is mm. that we've done, that substance needs to be incorporated into our body mm. so our body can understand it first mm. before our mind does. Mm -hmm. So it's going from the body to the mind later. The mind is already in our culture very, very active and very ready to start integrating. But the rest mm. is actually to allow it to incorporate into the embodied form mm. first. Mm. Uh, so that is something I often recommend, uh, you know, for a day or two at least, to really not plan anything major, but really let that body rest. Mm. And then the rest will come from different journaling practices to somatic experiences and exercises mm. to revisiting some of these moments through music as an anchor point, mm. uh, setting up mm. a ritual for yourself. There's a lot of different ways to integrate, but that very immediate moment of rest is actually very critical. Mm -hmm. mm. Amazing. So beautiful. Yeah. Wow. Hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I've just come back from an ISTA week long training myself um, last week. I'm really three days into my integration process, and as many of them as I've done, it's this, the process is still the same. Yeah, my body has been through an, ex, an intense uh, altered state in and out of it throughout the week, and, and um, but yeah, yeah, I definitely feel it in my body and I sleep longer mm -hmm. um, in the days following the training. And, I, and I'm, yeah, and, and this idea of like what you just said about li maybe you listen to some music to revisit some moments. Yeah. And, I, and I've read that um, uh, people working, like clinicians working in psychedelic therapy will often take notes of what the person is saying or what the patient or the client is saying or the, or the experience that they're having. They'll take notes throughout the experience mm. so that in the integration process, they can be sort of fed back in every now and then to sort of um, remind of some of the things that occurred. Mm. Um, I guess to yeah, revisit it in just piece by piece, piece by piece to like keep on planting those seeds back in uh, to the consciousness, I guess, as, yeah. as, as you're integrating and coming back without having to go and like, so it's not like you have to go and dive back into a total altered state yeah. in order to experience it again. It's actually like, okay, how do I harvest and fold, fold those realizations or that experience into, into my everyday life? Yeah. I feel, I feel myself going through that process as well. At the yeah. yeah. And you know, when you talk about like the people on the other side, a big part of what mm. we also help equip people through their integration sort of plan or method, mm -hmm. a big part of the method is also understanding who are the people that are supporting you or not supporting you after that experience. Mm -hmm. So we're very easily able to go ourselves and make our own decision to have this altered state, but who are we coming home to? Are we mm -hmm. coming home to partners that under that have been there before, mm. or are we coming home to somebody who mm. has no idea what just happened mm. and doesn't have that language and framework of understanding? How are we sharing what it is that happened to us, to whom and why, mm -hmm. and how can it be met by the other in a way that that doesn't cause actually more harm than good mm. because the other person might judge or might make us an assumption or might react in a way that we're not ready to feel. Mm. Um, this is a big part of integration yeah. is actually the support system. Yeah. And it doesn't even have to be personal, but our professional support system. Mm. When we go back to work, how do we talk about or make sense or not talk about what just happened to us? Mm. Uh, many people go through a very deep experience, um, regardless, you know, depending on the, you know, with ISTA or with the plant medicine journey, and they have no idea how to, 
to really incorporate that in their life in a way that can be met by others mm. with um, the care and that they or that they need. Yeah, yeah. And so a big part of integration is also the the people around mm -hmm. to support. Yeah, yeah. This is this is something we emphasize towards the end of, end of our training. Okay, what? Yeah, how how are you going to approach that? exactly those kinds of questions, how to have those conversations with the people who haven't been on the journey with you. Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, our loved ones, our friends, these kinds of things. Um, but also what we see um, and what we actually encourage is for people to set up a few days as like a, um, a in a kind of like halfway house situation, yeah. you know, go somewhere, get an Airbnb, take some time out, plans having some time out from your regular life that's also not the training or the retreat, yeah. but just like a, an intermediate um, space, like physical space, but also time space yeah. where you can like take that rest, start to work out like the conversations, how the conversations might look and develop a sort of plan yeah yeah that's a great point yeah. having a kind of a transition yeah, phase. transitional phase yeah, yeah for sure um question without notice um in in the easter in the easter trainings what, uh, what we're also working with is sexuality mm -hmm. and a lot of the um uh, uh, and, and that and everything that 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 entails um and it's clear to me that sexuality, depending on how we experience it, is, can also be an alt, can also involve an altered state of yes. consciousness. Um, and I'm interested by something you were saying earlier, um, where you emphasize the distinction between altered, altered states of consciousness. Like they're not all the same, obviously. Our experience of one can be very different to ex our experience of another. Um, one kind of altered state acts on the brain chemistry, acts on the body in a way that could be di very different to another altered state of consciousness. Um, it w um, what could you say about sexuality as an altered, potentially an altered state, mm -hmm. and 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 working with it? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, in comparison to these other ways that you that you more deal with. Um, um, for, for me, I, th I think about like, um, oh, it's something we're often working with is people's, um, patterns of behavior with regards to their sexuality, their personal experiences, negative or positive of sexuality in their lives. And, and then they arrive. So in most cases, people have had some experience of sexuality involving other people, um, often with themselves in some way. And it's an exploration phase with, you know, trial and error, mm -hmm. some negative experiences, some positive ones. And then for one reason or another, they come into an ISTA space um, and meet those experiences and their present experience of sexuality in, in a conscious way. Like mm -hmm. they're, they're wanting to go, okay, so what is my sexuality? What is my... Yeah my experience of it how do i want to explore it um what changes could i make or what do i want to keep on doing um and sometimes they're doing they're asking those questions for the first time um so with, with all that how is there some sort of doorway into approaching sexuality as an altered state that you could sort of open open for us or a perspective mm -hmm. that you could give to us yeah yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful question. I think why people work with altered states, like I, we had said at the beginning, mm. is to have this kind of sense of deep connection with something outside of us, right? So there's a mm. connection within and then the connection with on the out and how those two come together. And from what I see is that... Uh, Beyond the fact that, you know, when we're, we're having sexual experiences, which can release a whole host of hormones and, mm. and stuff that, that actually help induce that, that ecstasis, mm -hmm. that altered state, there is this deep feeling when, when we're, when we have, when we're uh, navigating our sexuality of very much intentional presence in our bodies and what it does for us. Mm -hmm. We feel that 
coming from within, right? Mm -hmm. It's the sexual energy. This, this, there's something there that um, is we didn't maybe see before mm -hmm. that an altered state helps to to rise out of. Right. right? So it's right. like an uncovering. Altered states help really surface a lot of things, and mm -hmm. I think sexuality is about surfacing something that maybe had been pressed down or dormant for whatever reason, for whatever our history. Mm. Um, and then kind of looking at how we relate with others, this like sense of this unity, right? So we, we, we are relating sexually so that we can feel this, this connection mm. um, that's beyond us. Mm. So we exist in, in this world to also be in, um, in relationship. Right, relationship mm -hmm. to us, but in relationship to other, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and navigating that relationship mm -hmm. can can like altered states help to evoke that that like unifying force that that kind of exists. Mm -hmm. um, that's just more like what comes to me. I think it's it's um, yeah, yeah, it feels right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, this um, it, it, that's that's amazing. Um, it, and it reminds me of, I think, another podcast I had listened to at some previous point in my life um, that was talking about psychedelic substances as, um, and I actually know this from being a bartender for a long time and dealing with not the psychedelic substance, but the, the alcohol and, um, and whatever else people would take when they visit the venues that I was working in, um, that I, I noticed this quite clearly, like, in, in one sense, people are experiencing the substance that they are taking in. Mm -hmm. um, but in a maybe probably more profound sense, what is that's just helping to evoke something from within right. you. Yeah. yeah, right. And and that's what I'm hearing in what you're saying. Um, like sexuality, uh, yeah, we notice that uh, that it awaken something from within us that's precisely it and and that altered state actually just opens up like a channel so so we experience ourselves and mm -hmm. and some part of us that yeah maybe we've we've put down or put aside um is, is brought out and and it's sort of and if we do it consciously we're kind of one of the things maybe that we're doing is inviting it out to sort of meet that part of us within ourselves or inviting it out to meet others and um perhaps, or just ourselves, right? Yeah. We emphasize this. Yeah. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to involve others, but, yeah. but how beautiful, actually, if, if we invite some, some loving, um, life-exploring life part of ourselves to, to be the thing that comes out to meet with other people. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I guess I've got a lingering question which goes, which goes in another direction. Um, but is related um, with with sexuality or, or any other substance or experience we might bring on to ourselves. Um, I imagine there's always the potential for it to unlock or um, yeah unlock stored traumatic experience from the past, um, and maybe this comes on in the present moment quite strongly. Um, and yeah, like I'm guessing that this has some associate. If this does happen to us, there's some association between that and the, and a difficult experience, or, or you know, like a yeah. um, a difficult trip. Um, is there anything that you'd say that you haven't said already um, about 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 trauma trauma coming up in the present moment and, and how we might approach that either as the person in the altered state or or someone who's sort of helping supporting someone in an altered state yeah i will say for someone supporting someone in an altered state that is really about establishing prior um mm what can be helpful to, you know, for if something does occur, we cannot know to have a sort of a therapeutic or contract mm -hmm. around how that person wants to be um, supported. Uh, because oftentimes the trauma that comes up is due to something that had happened in relationship in the past, for mm -hmm. example, whatever mm -hmm. that relation is and that supporter 
in many ways when someone's in an altered state kind of takes on the role of that traumatic incident. And so it's a real responsibility for the supporter to know how to best navigate that for that specific individual. Mm -hmm. And that's where having sort of the conversations around touch and mm -hmm. what um, is appropriate and what isn't. And mm. to, to be aware as a facilitator of, or a trip sitter or whatever you might be, that what you do can, can, it's not about you, but it's the sort of a projection of what might be in that person's field as they're revisiting the trauma. And um, to just be extra careful around that, that's where, you know, informed consent and the boundary setting and all of that is really important mm. in terms of the individual having this traumatic experience in the moment, um, what's really helpful for integration is having um, a, a trauma-informed um, supporter, coach, therapist who can help navigate that. Because what happens is when we're achieving this during the altered state, even if afterwards it subsides for us and we feel that, okay, we, we navigated that great. That happened in the moment. It was really challenging, but then I'm okay now. Mm -hmm. It still lives in us. It's still in the body. It's still stored. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. having like really intentional trauma informed ways of supporting that in integration without mm -hmm. reaching the altered state, again mm -hmm. so that it can be dealt with and navigated is really really important it's mm -hmm. a really par important part of a any kind of framework you want to develop on integration is to know that if that is there that that should be dealt with outside of the altered state uh -huh. with more even more intention mm -hmm. because that's where it can be a more controlled environment you have a, a very uh, informed person to support you with mm -hmm. that uh, mm -hmm. That's what I would say on, on that aspect. Yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. I'm so glad you, you emphasized that. Yeah, because we, we can have many realizations. We can experience, like we can have visions of of things from the past and things we want for the future in altered states. We're, we're, we're very sort of open in, in many ways. Um, and the things that we can see, whether it's like a realization of trauma that's come come up within us or something else, yeah, we then have the opportunity to go, okay, that's something I need to, yeah. like, resol resolve maybe in the case of trauma. And I, and I can see that that's the case now. So you, 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 you have this amazing opportunity to do that for yourself. And then it's actually about following up and going, okay, that I, you know, maybe I need to speak to someone on an ongoing basis until that is resolved yeah. or, yeah, yeah. I th this I would want to put like an underline under this, like um, uh, as one of the as one of the amazing ways that we can use um, altered states of consci consciousness for our own kind of healing and, mm -hmm. and self development and, and community development. Like to go, hey, what you experienced there, what you realized there, the thoughts that you have, the embodied state, that's one thing, but it really is just to like awaken some things yes. that you then act on in the days, weeks, months exactly. following. Yeah. It's not meant to get resolved. It can, you know, sometimes it does, but it isn't meant to be that is the container for the healing. Mm. It's yeah. just the awakening. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. It's been so good to talk to you, Amanda. Is, is there anything lingering that you would want to um, share with our audience? Maybe maybe something that's emerging in your own explorations or practice or, or something that we didn't touch on in our conversation already? Um, I mean, I loved having this conversation. I'm also really grateful that you had asked me, also as someone who has not yet been part of, of ISTA or anything, but knows a bit of... The, that world and to be open to seeing this I mean these are all altered states that we're exploring and I just want to emphasize that people who are doing so have to, to see this as like an opening of many many different tools and ways to to really explore the self mm -hmm. um, and that if we integrate it that's where the real magic happens mm -hmm. and then the real medicine is in the integration um, and making meaning and making sense of these, these peak states, these altered states. And 
I mean, what's just happening with me is, is deepening this, this method and this practice. And we'll have a course coming on soon for facilitators and professionals. So if people who want to understand integration more deeply and how to support others, um, they can learn um, these sort of tools and, and different methods that we have. Mm. Uh, that's been a big part of what I've been deepening into is the actual techniques and how to apply them to specific individual cases that I've seen and that I have in my own coaching, but also what others come to me with, okay, how do I support this person with this particular um, integration issue? Um, that's been really interesting to navigate that um, in my own life. Amazing. And, and where could people find out more information about that offering and others that you have? Yeah, so people can check my, my Instagram, my website, uh, the website of the course. I can share all of that with you. Awesome. We'll put that in the show notes, so to speak. Yeah. Such a pleasure. Um, all like Sorry. safe travels for your journeys that I know are coming up in, in, in the near future and uh, looking forward to speaking to you again soon. Thank you, Simon. Mm -hmm.